Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mary Chris and welcome to my booktube series. The book that I'm going to be reading this for this series is A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. A couple of side notes. If you see me looking down, it's because I'm looking at my script because I want this to be as smooth as possible. I've been re-watching my other videos and I constantly want to improve and so I don't want to be wasting time. So I decided to make a script per chapter. It, this also helps me even understand the book even more. I It reminds me of having a it reminds me of having a book report project at school and now I understand why they have it. It's very, very useful, especially because for me, English is my second language. Also, if I'm not on frame, I'm sorry. I still haven't gotten a camera that has a monitor, so I'm trying, 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 trying my best. Third point, the way I'm going to be doing this series is I will read always a passage from the book of what I think best describes my point. Again, because English is my second language, I do need help in understanding this book. Plus, this is not a familiar history for me. That's why I'm reading this book because I want to learn. I think that's the whole purpose of this series is I want to learn and this helps me become accountable. And since ever since the series, I have been sticking to this book usually I have all these books in my house I have all these books on my list and it keeps me from reading them because honestly I have a really 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 busy life and one of my goals is to read more books and I'm so thankful for YouTube because of this I have been indulging in this book and really learning so much and I think that's about it oh yes I will be linking um, the videos my previous videos in the description down below if I forgot any information. Yay! <laughs> Let's get to this! This chapter starts with Bacon's Rebellion and its motives of why such rebellion started. Bacon's Rebellion become with a conflict over how to deal with Indians who were close by on Western frontier constantly threatening whites who had been ignored when huge land grants around Jamestown were given away had gone west to find land. And then they encountered Indians. Were those frontier Virginians resentful that the politicos and landed aristocrats who controlled the colony's government in Jamestown first purchased them westward into Indian territory and then seemed indecisive in fighting the Indians? That might explain the character of their rebellion, not easily classifiable as either anti aristocratic anti-aristocratic or anti-Indian because it was both. The conditions were ripe for the rebellion. The conditions were ripe for rebellion to occur, rather. Violence had escalated in on the frontier. Before the rebellion, some Doig Indians took a few hogs to redress a debt, and whites retrieving the hogs murdered two Indians. The dogs then sent out a party to kill a white herdsman, after which a white militia company killed 24 Indians. This led to a series of Indian raids, with the Indians outnumbered turning to guerrilla warfare. The House of Burgess in Jamestown declared war on Indians, but proposed to exempt those Indians who cooperated. These seemed to anger the frontiers people who wanted to win a war, but also rescinded the high taxes assessed to pay for the war. It was not just a threat of violence on all sides, but it was time of severe poverty. Times were hard in 1676. There was a genuine distress, genuine poverty. All contemporary sources speak of the great mass of people as living in severe economic straits, writes Wilcombe Washburn, who using colonial records has done an exhaustive study of Bacon's rebellion. It was a dry summer, ruining the corn crop which was needed for food and a tobacco crop needed for export. Governor Berkeley in his 70s, tired of holding office, wrote warily about his situation. How miserable that man is that governs a people where six parts of seven at least are poor, indebted, discontented, and armed. Bacon himself was not impoverished. 
Bacon had a good bit of land and was probably more enthusiastic about killing Indians than about redressing the grievances of the poor, but he became a symbol of mass resentment against Virginia establishment and was elected in the spring of 1676 to the House of Burgess. Bacon's rebellion was both anti-aristocrat and anti-Indian. Bacon's declaration of the people of July 1676 shows a mixture of populist resentment against the rich and the frontier and frontier hatred of Indians. It indicted the Berkeley administration for unjust taxes, for putting favorites in high positions, for monopolizing the beaver trade, and for not protecting the Western farmers from the Indians. Then Bacon went out to attack the friendly Pamunkey Indians, killing eight, taking others prisoner, plundering their possessions. When Bacon died, the rebellion didn't last for that much longer. In the fall, Bacon, aged 29, fell sick and died. Because of, as a contemporary puts it, swarms of vermin that bred into his body. A minister, apparently not a sympathizer, wrote this epitaph. Bacon is dead. I'm sorry that my heart that lies in flux should take the hangman's part. Howard Sin further explained the situation to help us understand the conditions of that time. It was a complex chain of oppression in Virginia. The Indians were plundered by white frontiersmen who were taxed and controlled by the Jamestown elite, and the whole colony was being exploited by England, who bought the colonists tobacco at prices it dictated and made a hundred thousand pounds a year for the king. Burke himself returning to England years earlier to protest the English Navigation Acts, which gave English merchants a monopoly of colonial trade, had said, we cannot but resent that 40,000 people should be impoverished to enrich little more than 40 merchants who, being the only buyers of our tobacco, give us what they please for it and after it is here, sell it how they please and indeed have 40,000 servants in us at chapter, at, sorry, at cheaper rates than any other men slaves. The wealth gap between the rich and the poor was so wide that Bacon's rebellion had an overwhelming support by the Virginia population. Salas' inclination of multitude to support Bacon was due, he said, of hopes of leveling. Leveling meant equalizing the wealth. Leveling was to behind countless of actions of poor whites against the rich in all the English colonies. In century and a half before the, re the revolution, the servants who joined Bacon's rebellion were part of a large underclass of miserably poor whites who came to North America, who came to the North American colonies from England cities whose governments were anxious to be rid of them. In England, the development of commerce and capitalism in the 1500s and the 1600s, the enclosing of land for the production of wool filled the cities with vagrant poor and from the reign of Elizabeth on, laws were pa passed to punish them, imprison them in workhouses or exile them. The poor were seen as criminals during the Elizabethan era. One of the punishment of being poor was being exiled to America and turned into indentured servants. Such persons found begging could be stripped to the waist and whipped bloody, could be sent out of the city, sent to workhouses, or transported out of the country. After signing the indenture in which the immigrants agreed to pay their cost of passage by working for a master for five or seven years, they were often imprisoned until, until the ship sailed to make sure they did not run away. In the year 1619, the Virginia House of Burgess, born that year as the first representative assembly in America, it was also the year of the first importation of black slaves, provided for the recording and enforcing of contracts between servants and masters. As in any contract between unequal powers, the parties appeared on paper as equals, but enforcement was far easier for master than servant. 
they also had a treacherous journey to America. The voyage to America lasted 8 to 10 or 12 weeks, and the servants were packed into ships with the same fanatic concern for profits that marked the slave ships. If the weather was bad and the trip took too long, they ran out of food. The slop, the sloop sea flower leaving Belfast in 1741 was at sea 16 weeks, and when it arrived in Boston for 46 of its one when it arrived in Boston, 46 of its 106 passengers were dead of starvation, six of them eaten by the survivors. On another trip, 32 children died of hunger and disease and were thrown into the ocean. Gottlieb Mittelberger, a musician traveling from Germany to America around 1750, wrote about his voyage. During the journey, the ship is full of pitiful signs of distress, smells, fumes, horrors, vomiting, various kinds of seasickness, fever, dysentery, headaches, heat, constipation, boils, scurvy, cancer, mouth rot, and similar afflictions. All of them caused by the age and the high salted state of food, especially of the meat, as well as by the very bad and filthy water. And to add to all of the storage of food hunger, thirst, frost, heat, dampness, fear, misery, vexation, and lamination, as well as other troubles. On board our ship on a day on which we had a great storm, a woman about to give birth and unable to deliver under the circumstances were pushed through one of the potholes into the sea. I was shocked reading this. I can only imagine the horror and desperation they were going through. When they arrive in, to America, tragedy continues. Indentured servants were brought and sold like slaves. An announcement in the Virginia Gazette in March 28, 1771 read, Just arrived at Lidstown, the ship Justicia, with about 100 healthy servants, men and boys. The sale will commence on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. More abuse followed, including rape, beating to death, whippings, mutilations, and more. A letter from an immigrant in America says, Whoever is well off in Europe better remain there. Here is misery and distress, same as everywhere, and for certain persons and conditions incomparable more than Europe. It was so bad that the, mass, that the servants were committing suicide. The masters even tried to control their sexual lives. The master tried to control completely the sexual lives of the servants. It was in his economic interest to keep women servants from marrying or from having sexual relations because childbearing would interfere with work. Benjamin Franklin, writing as Poor Richard in 1736, gave advice to his readers. Let thy maid servants be faithful, strong, and homely. Servants were not allowed to marry without their master's permission. And if they disobey, harsh punishments will ensue. Although colonial laws existed to stop excess against servants, they were not very well enforced. We learn from Richard Morse's comprehensive study of early court records in government and labor in early America. Servants did not participate in juries. Masters did. And being propertyless, servants did not vote. Desperate times called for desperate measures. The servants would try to organize and rebel, but they either did not go through with it or someone from their group will rat them out. The person who tells authority about planned rebellion and demonstration will get a reward as well. The ads were against the indentured servants, mass uprising were impossible to organize, so they would do acts of disobedience instead, and this too was met by harsh consequences. However, the masters were in so much fear of uprisings, especially after Baker's Rebellion, that a law was passed. Whereas many evil disposed servants 
in this late times of horrid rebellion, taking advantage of looseness and liberty of time, did depart from their service and follow the rebels in rebellion, wholly neglecting their master's employment, whereby the said masters have suffered such great damage and injury. In 1666, a New England court accused a couple of death of a servant after the mistress had cut off the servant's toes. The jury voted acquittal. In Virginia, in the 1660s, a master had con was convicted of raping two women servants. He also was known to be his own wife and children. He had whipped and chained another servant until he died. The master was berated by the court but specifically cleared on rape charge despite overwhelming evidence. Even then, there was a two-tiered justice system. How can they pass law against these servants? They do it by creating them as the other. They would depict servants as dirty, lazy, rough, carry diseases, so on and so forth. They try to despise them and treat them as subhuman to justify these vile treatments. Treatments. This is so sad to me because this happens time and time again. Even as well as the slaves, black slaves and indigenous peoples of that time. In order to commit this crime, a person must think of these other humans as lesser than. Let us take the Mexican immigrants, for example, where they are called criminals and rapists to justify their detainment. They are separated from their families. These situations are eerily similar. Have we not learned as human beings that this is not the right thing to do? That we should treat each other with kindness and respect? That these borders are all man-made? Aside from rebelling, the servants also tried to escape and sometimes went on strike. However, the mechanism of control was formidable. Strangers had to show passport or certificates to prove they were free men. Agreements among the colonies provided for the extradition of fugitive servants. These became the basis of the clause in the U.S. Constitution that persons held to service or labor in one state escaping into another shall be delivered up. Sometimes the servants go on strike because they were fed so poorly. They would complain that they were only fed beans and bread. They were too weak to work and so the masters would force them to work and take them to court and the punishment for refusing to work would be 30 lashes. When the servants were finally free, it was found that the first batches of servants became landowners and politically active in the colony. But by the second half of the century, more than half the servants, even after 10 years of freedom, remained landless. Servants became tenants, providing cheap labor for the la large planters both during and after their servitude. In the circumstances, the gap of the rich and poor will inevitably widen. I mean, it was already was already wide. By 1700, 1700s, there were 50 rich families in Virginia with wealth equivalent to 50,000 pounds and a huge sum those days who lived off the labor of black slaves and white servants owned the plantation, sat on the governor's council, served as local magistrates in Maryland. The settlers were ruled by a proprietor whose right of total control over the colony had been granted by the English king. Between 1650 and 1689, there were five revolts against the proprietor. In the Colony Carolinas, the fundamental constitutions were written in the 1660s by John Locke, who is often considered the philosophical, philosophical father of founding fathers and the American system. Locke's constitution set up feudal type aristocracy in which eight barons would own 40% of the colony's land and only a baron could be a governor. When the crown took direct control of North Carolina after rebellion against the land arrangement, rich speculators seized half a million acres for themselves, monopolizing the good farming land near the coast. 
For people desperate for land, squatted on bits of farmland and fought all through the pre-revolutionary period against landlords' attempts to collect rent. That is another example of how the wealth gap is paralleling today. It's really amazing how this book, I think, is such an essential read because there's still so many things that they're doing now that they were already doing back then. And in order for us to break free from this cycle of injustice, we need to learn our history so we can be free of them. The rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer and not owning property has serious repercussions. As Boston grew from 1687 to 7070, the percentage of adult males who were poor perhaps rented a room or slept in the back of a tavern owned no property doubled from 14% of the adult males was 29% and loss of property meant the loss of voting rights. There were poor houses built, but it wasn't enough. Strikes, work stoppage went on to show the discontent as well as the hopes to better the situation. Free white workers were better off than slaves or servants, but they still resented unfair treatment by the wealthier classes. As early as 13, 1636, an employer of the coast of Maine reported that his workmen and fishermen fell into a mutiny because they had withheld their wages. They deserted en masse. Five years later, carpenters in, carpenters in Maine protesting against inadequate food engaged in a slowdown. But the Gloucester American labor history took place when the authorities told a group of troublesome shipwrights they could not work or work a stroke or work more. There were also riots. England was involved in wars during this time as well. And it is back then and now wars are profitable, but of course at the expense of the poor. And there were also riots. There were also riots. Bostonians rioted also against impressment in which men were drafted for naval service. They surrounded the house of the government, beat up the sheriff, locked up a deputy sheriff, and stormed the townhouse where the general court sat. The militia did not respond when called to put them down, and the governor fled. The crowd was condemned by Emerson's group as riotous, tumultuous assembly of foreign seamen, servants, Negroes, and other persons of mean and vile condition. England was involved in wars during this time as well, and it was back then and now. Wars are profitable, but of course, at the expense of the poor. Throughout this period, England was fighting a series of wars. Queen Anne's war in the early 1700s, King George's war in the 1730s. Some merchants made fortunes from these wars, but for most people, they meant higher taxes, unemployment, poverty, an anonymous pamphleteer in Massachusetts writing angrily after King George's war described the situation. Poverty and discontent appear in every face except the continences of the rich and dwell upon every tongue he spoke a few men fed by lust of power and lust of fame and lust of money who got rich during the war no wonder such men build ships houses buy farms set up coaches chariots live very splendidly purchase fame posts of honor he called them birds of prey enemies to all communities wherever they live There was a definite fear of revolt, and perhaps the Indians, black slaves, and poor whites would cooperate and overthrow the elite. What if these different despised groups, the Indians, the slaves, the poor whites, should combine? Even before there were so many blacks in the 17th century, 
There was, Abbott Smith puts it, a lively fear that the servants joined the Negroes or Indians to overcome the small number of servants. The elites, however, still had the upper hand. By monopolizing the good land on the eastern seaboard, they forced landless whites to move westward to the frontier, there to encounter the Indians and to be a buffer for the seaboard rich against Indian troubles. While becoming more dependent on the government for protection, Bacon's rebellion, rebellion was instructive to conciliate a diminishing Indian population at the expense of infuriating a coalition white frontiersmen was very risky. Better to wake war on the Indian and gain support of the white. Divert possible class conflict by turning for whites against Indians for security of the elite. In the northern colonies, except on Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Rhode Island, where there was a close contact and sexual mixing, there was not much opportunity for Africans and Indians to meet in large numbers. New York had the largest slave population in, north, in the north, and there was some contact between blacks and Indians in 1712, when Africans and Indians joined in insurrection. This was quickly suppressed. In the Carolinas, however, whites was outnumbered by blacks with leaves, and nearby Indian tribes in the 1750s, 25,000 whites faced 40,000 black slaves with 60,000 Creek, Cherokee, Choctaw, and Chickasaw Indians in the area. Gary Nash writes, Indian uprising that punctuated the plots that were nipped in the bud kept South Carolinians sickeningly aware that only through the greatest vigilance and through policies designed to keep their enemies divided could they hope to remain in control of the situation. They also made policies to ensure that these oppressed groups will not mingle and organize. And so, laws were passed prohibiting free blacks from traveling to Indian country. Treaties with Indian tribes contained clause requiring the return of fugitive slaves. Governor Littletown of South Carolina wrote in 1738, it has always been the policy of this government to create an aversion in them, to Indians, to Negroes. Part of this policy involved using black slaves in South Carolina militia to fight Indians. Still, the government was worried about black revolt and during the Cherokee War in 1760s, a motion to whip to equip 500 slaves to fight Indians lost in Carolina Assembly by a single vote. The, the elite especially feared, feared poor whites and black slaves procreating. It was a potential combination of poor whites and blacks that caused the most fear among the wealthy white planters. If there had been a natural racial repugnance that some theorists have assumed, control would have been easier. But sexual attraction was powerful across racial lines. In 1743, a grand jury in Charleston, South Carolina denounced the too common practice of criminal conversation with Negro and other slaves wenches in this province. Mixed offspring continued to be produced by black slaves sex relations throughout the colonial period in spite of laws prohibiting interracial marriage in Virginia, Massachusetts, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, the Carolinas, Georgia, by declaring children illegitimate, they would keep them inside a black family so the white population could remain pure and in control. By 1720s, the black slaves revolting became a greater fear. In 1720s, we'd fear of slave rebellion growing, white servants were allowed in Virginia to join the militia as substitutes for white freemen. At the same time, slave patrols were established in Virginia to deal with the great dangers that may happen by insurrection of Negroes. Poor white men and would make the rank file of these patrols and get monetary reward. According to Edmund Morgan, racism wasn't natural, but rather According to Edmund Morgan, racism wasn't natural, but rather came out of class divide. Racism was becoming more and more practical. Edmund Morgan, on the base of his careful study of slavery in Virginia, sees racism not as natural, 
to black white difference, but something coming out of class scorn. A realistic device for control. If freemen with disappointed hopes should make common cause with slaves of desperate hope, the results might worse, might be worse than anything Bacon had done. The answer to the problem, obvious if unspoken and only gradually recognized, was racism. To separate dangerous free whites from dangerous black slaves by a screen of racial contempt. In the beginning of 1700s, the landless whites were used as a buffer between elites and Indians since the Indians were deemed uncontrollable. However, in the 1760s and 1770s, they had a new buffer, which was the emerging white middle class. There was still another control which became handy as the colonies grew and which had crucial consequences for the continued rule of the elite throughout American history. Along with the very rich and the very poor, there developed a white middle class of small planters, independent farmers, city artisans, who given small rewards for joining forces with merchants and planters would be a solid buffer against black slaves, frontier Indians, and very poor whites. Even though there were skilled free black men, free black craftsmen, laws were passed to keep them from competing against white artisans. As early as 1686, the Council of New York ordered that no Negro or slave be suffered to work as a bridge as a port about any goods either imported or exported from or into the city. In the southern towns too, White craftsmen and traders were protected from Negro competition in 1764. The Southern Carolina Legislature prohibited the Charleston masters from employing Negroes or other slaves as mechanics or in handicraft trades. Howard conclu concludes this chapter. Those upper class rule needed to make concessions to the middle class without damaging their own wealth or power at the expense of slaves, Indians, and poor whites. This bought loyalty. And to bind that loyalty with something more powerful even than material advantage, the ruling group found in 1760s and 1770s a wonderfully useful device. That device was the language of liberty and equality which could unite just enough whites to fight a revolution against England without ending slavery or inequality. There is so much parallels in this chapter in the times that we live in now. The same divisive tactics are used in the benefits of the elite and ruling class. What do you think? Please let me know in the comments below and tell me if you have read this book. I will also link my first two videos in this series in the description below. This book can be so, it like makes me sad sometimes. Like reading this book, yes, of course it enlightens me, but it does, it does saddens me because we have this thought that we've, We've become better. And after the election of Barack Obama, we had this notion that, okay, there's a black president now. We're, we're colorblind. We don't see color anymore. And I think that definitely kind of have a step backwards because all these things were still happening. All the racial stuff, injustices in the world. And this is not isolated to the United States. And I think we have this kind of illusion that things are better. And I'm not saying that they are not better. Of course, we've improved. However, as I've said in my conclusion, is that there's 
a constant battle of justice and freedom and the powers that be to eliminate or lessen those freedom for their own well-being and i know it's just such like a fantasy almost that i wish that we can all just get along and that greed would not be such a factor and that if you have a lot i'm not saying give up your wealth but that everyone should have at least an equal opportunity for education for health care in canada we're really lucky that we do have health care that everyone should have that i think in every country at least like for the basic everyone there should be universal health care universal education and everybody gets a chance to be educated and i'm really glad at the timing of this book i think this book is a good history book even though sometimes it does make me sad but i need to just power through it and i think it doesn't matter if you're right wing or left wing we're all human beings and one live in a planet that's just that is kind to everyone like we can we can set all those things aside i just wish wish we would hopefully get to that point and so it doesn't even matter what your political beliefs are this is a great read okay that's about it um i'm always like low energy after this even though i've reread this already because it does make me sad but anyways i will see you next time on my chapter four and for whoever is watching this i really really appreciate it and like this video if you like booktube and reading and discussing again you don't need to agree with me even having a discussion doesn't matter we're all humans and all we all want to live in a nice clean planet where everyone has a chance to just have a good life i think all of us deserve that and like as well if you like history just like me and comment what books you think i should read and comment on your thoughts of chapter three if you've read this book before or if you're reading it with me and share to fellow book lovers and comment subscribe share and like and that's about it i hope you have a good day and i hope we just we all all of us just have to be nice to everyone and we'll see you next time bye